Good afternoon to all of you here uh, present with us and definitely also good afternoon to those listening online. I'm very happy to present to you our uh, PhD, I3HPD researcher, who will, uh, Shiri Mermelstein, who will uh, introduce you into orphan drugs, clinical uncertainty and prices, explain to you the relation between indeed the clinical uncertainty and the effect it has on uh, the pricing of those um, orphan drugs. Uh, she studied um, her, well, did her PhD in uh, Trinity College in Dublin, in Ireland, uh, where she was a research assistant and a teaching ass assistant. Uh, and now she's doing her PhD with us, uh, obviously. Um, and she's studying actually on uh, studying the relationship between innovation policies, alternative IP models, global diffusion, diffusion and the affordability of new and uh, innovative health technologies. And also will present, uh, will be uh, held by uh, Mathias de Watripon. As you know, all know him, he's the co-director of the I3H Institute, an expert in contract theory. Uh, and as you also know, he's an expert in uh, vaccine policy here at, well, first at the GEMS and then uh, now at GEES. He will uh, also present to you today and discuss this um, paper written by uh, hans georg Eichler and others. Thank you. Okay, uh, so hello everyone. Um, I'm not going to present uh, something that is related to my. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to present a paper by Hans Gerdarter and his uh, colleagues. Uh, it's not a paper that I was involved in writing in any way, it's just a reading seminar. Uh, so refer all the hard questions to them. Uh, um, okay, so um, so they start their uh, paper by describing the shift from uh, blockbuster drugs to uh, to niche buster drug development. Uh, when niche buster drugs are drugs uh, targeting a very small uh, group of patients. Uh, to treat uh, rare diseases. Uh, usually, uh, at least in Europe, the definition is uh, diseases in fact less than five in 10,000 people. But uh, in total, these diseases are quite uh, prevalent. 30 million people just in Europe uh, are uh, diagnosed with rare disease. Um, and they take the healthcare perspective. So, uh, Hans Gerhardt and his team are mostly uh, involved in insurance companies. Um, Hans Gerhardt uh, is the uh, consultant physician of the Austrian Association of the uh, Social Insurance. And, and in this paper, they describe the challenges and the uh, risks that uh, are due to uh, the shift mainly to orphan drugs, which are both uh, ultra expensive um, and also characterized with moderate effect size and uh, high uncertainty about their natural effects. So uh, they go, they review some of the main challenges um, and they described the first one, which is the breakthrough versus moderate uh, effect size. Uh, for example, they bring the uh, recent uh, stem cell gen therapy strigalis, uh, used uh, to treat patients with uh, ADHD, the type of very rare uh, genetic disorder. And this medicine has 100% survival, at least in a clinical trial with small uh, sample of uh, 18 patients. Um, but this is not the common uh, case. The common case is a very small or uh, marginal effect size. Um, usually we see this with uh, orphan drugs to treat uh, rare cancers. Uh, but the first uh, point that we want to emphasize is that the development of uh, new uh, drugs, new orphan drugs, should not be discouraged, even if the effect size, the clinical effect size, is not very large. Um, 
your patients are also interested in small things that in drugs with heart rate exercise. Um, and that's the way science will follow. The, yes. When you mention that for the cancer diseases, they have uh, an imaginal of, or no survival benefits, do they still get the monopoly rights? Yeah, they still get monopoly. That's so they get exclusivity without benefits. It's a marginal benefit, so it's a few months of. of uh, but they get a 10 years protection. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Currently, there is no relation between the length of exclusivity and the clinical benefits. Yeah, Stina, I think that you mentioned often. I think we, it's not it's not that it has no benefit anymore. If it, at the end, if it is approved, it's because it has the, it has some benefit, but. I think the idea is to compare the benefit of this type of therapy, which might be marginal with other therapies for rare disease, which are gene therapy, where the, the effect is just spectacular. So that's... Yes, um, they contrast between stellar yeah. effect drugs and between drugs with marginal effect. And they say that the majority of new drugs have marginal effects, but that's the way science moves forward and they don't want uh, to discourage uh, this uh, development. Um, but uh, the more important point they make about the challenges that uh, health players uh, encounter now with new orphan drugs is the high uncertainty about the net clinical benefits at the time of uh, marketing authorization. So when a new drug enters the market, we rarely have uh, an high uncertainty about the net clinical benefit as we have in the case of the blockbuster drugs. And it's a result of, um, of the clinical development of these products. So if for a uh, drug that treat a uh, large population, uh, we have both credible evidence from uh, randomized control trials conducted on very large populations and from uh, real world data uh, collection, for uh, disease with uh, for drugs to treat uh, orphan disease, we have both small target population, but also a lot of the time small effect size, as I mentioned. Um, and this causes uh, statistical uh, challenge. Uh, it's harder to demonstrate the effect size of these products, um, and it's harder to collect uh, real world data for these products because of the Sometimes we talk about the medicine with 10 patients across Europe. So uh, it's not credible to rely on data from uh, real world uh, information. And the last challenge that is the most well known challenge is the ultra high prices of these medicines. Um, so sometimes it can get to 25 or 50 times higher than the annual cost of non-orphan drugs, uh, both for one of gene therapies, so one injection curative uh, treatment, uh, but also for uh, biological drugs that receive orphan designation. So these are used for routine treatment of chronic uh, diseases. Uh, so then the price per year is often much higher than the price per year of other non-orphan drugs. Um, and it results in several problems. So several orphan drugs were already taken off the market. Even stream valleys that they discuss in the paper as an example of a stellar effect drug is currently um, the investor, the main uh, company marketing the drug already uh, dropped it uh, due to commercial reasons. Um, so we see the effect of ultra high prices. But to add to this uh, challenge, there is also the cost of evidence generation that traditionally was uh, on the manufacturer that had to prove that the drug is effective. But with orphan drugs, a lot of, the, a lot of times the insurer has to uh, assess the effectiveness of the uh, new therapy. Shushi, may, may I ask you, perhaps yes. you will come back to this, but um, yeah, 
when you mentioned it would be interesting by the way to review which were those four of the drugs but my, my question is more so they were removed from the european market but they were still available in the u.s market um i actually don't know uh, i assume they are available in the u.s market because it's much more just a liberal open market and in europe because, i mean we, we might come back to this but you know, this is I and mean, we see this more and more often so you know very often we talk about inequalities between rich and poor countries, but you know, more and more, you could have examples of inequalities between the US and the European market. And I was just, uh, <coughs> I just heard recently that it might be the same with the Asian market. And, uh, yeah, there is ongoing discussion at the European Parliament about the new pharma regulation. And I heard that the pharma companies are are not very happy with the current position of the EU and they are considering to invest more more and more in US and Asia because the environment here they consider is not the one they would like to see, which is, which is another debate. But just to mention that, you know, this creates a new type of inequalities between rich countries. Yes, uh, so I was planning to uh, talk about it a bit later on but okay. uh, Stringvalix is actually a European drug. It was invented in Europe, it was developed in Europe, it's still marketed by a European company based in Italy and they are withdrawing the European markets. So it is all over like it's absurd the yeah. amount of money invested in the development by European agencies eventually it's not marketed in Europe. Um, Thank you. Okay, so at the heart of this paper, uh, the authors discuss the risk of uh, inefficiencies uh, in the context of orphan drug improvement. They adopt the uh, concept of inefficiencies from economics to the healthcare, uh, in healthcare context. Um, and as you can see in this quote, uh, they consider uh, economic inefficiency in healthcare as uh, what society, societal choices maximize the health outcomes gained from limited resources allocated to healthcare. Uh, and the first uh, of inefficiency they discuss is technical inefficiency, um, which is uh, related to the resources. So what is uh, the best use to use uh, the resources to available to maximize uh, the health outputs. And uh, they uh, argue that most of the uh, technical inefficiency in the context of uh, drug policy is due to high uncertainty about the clinical effect size that I presented in the previous slides. So uh, if you have very high levels of uh, high uncertainty, uh, Basically, payers are uh, flying blind when they discuss the prices, negotiate the prices with the drug companies. Um, and then it results in uh, high technical inefficiency in reimbursement decisions. That is, uh, payers might pay for patients that are unlikely to benefit from the new drug. So we don't maximize the health output uh, with the available resources. Okay, so uh, they come up with two main uh, mitigation strategies to uh, address technical inefficiency. The first one is uh, the performance-based managed entry agreements, which they consider as the main option to mitigate uh, technical inefficiencies. Uh, basically, uh, this is a framework to reduce the uh, uncertainty about the net clinical benefit uh, compared to the value and de-risk the, the economic uh, consequences of clinical uncertainty uh, basically means that uh, the price that the, the price dynamic of the new drug is dependent on the uh, clinical benefits uh, in a certain time period but uh, the 
outcome of this uh, strategy is the uh, increased administrative burden and how hard it is to implement these agreements. So it is increasing in Europe uh, dramatically over the last 10 years, but there are problems with the implementation of these agreements. Um, the second strategy we discussed is cross fair collaboration. So in just I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think that, that's important. You mentioned is no longer an option. Is no longer uh, reluctant. It's reluctant. It's reluctant. It's reluctant. It's reluctant. Yeah. Ah, okay. Then we have the that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. The double negation. Okay, we agree. They, they say that, yeah, they Reluctance is no longer an option, which means that this strategy is yeah, really at the forefront. forefront. Yes, this yeah, is the okay. only way to continue Sorry, with, yeah, uh, is... with orphan drugs reimbursement. Sorry, thank you. Uh, the second way they suggest, and it's all, all the, their perspective is the healthcare perspective, the payer perspective, it's not the general government, it's mainly from just the healthcare. Uh, so they should suggest uh, cross-payer collaboration. So for example, mm -hmm. European collaboration, which is an idea that is discussed for quite a long time now. Um, and that's to ensure that uh, the payers have sufficient negotiating power when they address uh, manufacturers. Uh, but it's also useful for uh, clinical evidence generation. So each country, each of these drugs that were uh, introduced in the European market in the last uh, 10 years is maybe treating 16, 20 people overall. That's according to what I could find. Um, and these people are spread across Europe and they receive the treatment usually in one or two countries. So they need to travel to different countries to receive treatment. So there is a crucial need in uh, collaboration between European countries to create, uh, to generate uh, real world evidence about the uh, efficiency. Um, I will not get to efficiency. Uh, and the main uh, inefficiency they focus on is the more societal, philosophical, uh, ethical, interesting uh, allocative inefficiency, which takes into account how uh, health resources distri are distributed across uh, the population uh, to maximize welfare. Uh, so it's rooted in welfare economics. It has uh, implications for opportunity costs. So if we uh, decide a high fraction of the healthcare budget is dedicated to treat uh, people with orphan diseases, what are the opportunity costs for the people who are not getting the uh, optimal treatment due to this decision? Uh, and they argue that payers have, uh, of, are obliged to ensure allocative efficiency. Uh, efficiency sorry. Uh, so the risk of allocative inefficiency remains high even if technical efficiency is achieved. So even if we have all the uh, information on how to use a certain drug and who to treat, when to treat, how much to treat, uh, even then, if the drug is extremely expensive, we risk uh, affecting the, distribu the equal distribution of uh, health resources across society. Um, okay. so, I think the most one of the most important points they make in this paper is their uh, argument about uh, the need to discuss uh, allocative inefficiency, allocative inefficiency in drug uh, reimbursement explicitly and in a transparent and structured way. So these discussions, they say, are already uh, conducted, but they are conducted by health insurers behind closed doors. It's not open to the public. Uh, it's not open to most policymakers. Um, and they want to bring some hard questions uh, to the table, to open up these hard questions and to try to target them uh, in a transparent way. Um, and they say it's outside of the comfort zone of most stakeholders, so both decision makers, uh, health providers, and patients. Because we need to decide how we 
allocate the resources available to the healthcare system across the different patient populations. Uh, and they argue as well that uh, it's illogical to assume that we can uh, incentivize or new orphan drugs. The European Union, for example, uh, incentivized the development of new orphan drugs by allowing uh, longer exclusivity periods and monopoly prices. <clears throat> um, and we cannot expect that we will spend, uh, that the expenditure on orphan drugs will be the same as the expenditure on uh, chronic diseases without these incentives. So if we are correcting for this market failure, what they call, and create the artificial monopoly, um, it comes up with new challenges. Uh, but we also have evidence that it's a societal priority. So drug, uh, both new pharmaceutical companies and uh, decision makers are focusing on orphan drugs. Um, and they are willing to pay above the standard price to ensure uh, equity in the distribution of uh, health resources and to allow um, patients with rare diseases to receive the same level of same quality of care as patients without rare diseases. And we know that this is not even the case yet. So most patients with rare diseases are not receiving equal treatment. There is no cure for their disease. So only for the uh, few diseases, rare diseases that uh, there is already a treatment, uh, health insurers are uh, allowing higher drug prices to promote equity in the system. Um, but the problem is that what is a too high cost for insuring uh, these uh, drugs? And the idea is that one of the solutions is to set up some benchmarks for uh, price negotiations. So, um, this, yes. I, I was exactly discussing that with the Shopsiatis last week. And we were thinking setting a, a, a price cap would be a good idea. But at the same time, it may be used as a coordination device. But everybody then says, my drug is worth the cap. So the yeah, total effects is not so clear. So do they discuss anything like that? Yeah, they discuss it exactly what uh, I'm going to discuss mm -hmm. now. But I will already answer that I don't have the uh, uh, answer about it. So it's, it's a solution they promote, but I agree that it might just- so They don't people consider to... the risk of coordination and collusion around the high price? Uh, they consider it. They mainly rely on another paper. So it's more, it's specified in another paper by other group of authors, but uh, I will come to it okay. in, the, in the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so they suggest, three strategies to uh, target, to mitigate uh, allocative inefficiencies. The first one is to avoid unjustified profitability of uh, drug companies. This is oriented towards the supplier. Uh, the second one is considering the fairness of spending. This is uh, a responsibility of the payers. And the last one is uh, a consideration more so than a strategy. And this is the uh, idea is that the concept that addressing the needs of uh, the few patients with rare diseases uh, may encourage innovation for uh, many people, so for much broader groups of uh, patients. And this applies to all levels of stakeholders. Okay, so uh, the first strategy is to avoid unjustified profitability, which is a big idea, but there are also uh, concrete ways to achieve it at least according to uh, their proposition. Um, and it starts from the concept that uh, producers of niche clusters should not make more profits than producers of uh, regular drugs, of blockbusters or any other drugs. And they suggest to set up a cost-effectiveness threshold that reflect the type of uh, the differences between uh, the development and cost of uh, orphan and non orphan drugs. Okay, so uh, again, it's a bit heavy slide. Uh, so 
they rely on a paper by Bernard uh, Drawn and uh, other authors, a uh, recent paper, and they review the development costs for uh, <coughs> drugs to treat uh, common diseases versus orphan drugs. And they say that there are several reasons why the development of uh, orphan drugs will actually be cheaper than the development of non-orphan drugs. First of all, because of the small uh, clinical trial size. Second of all, because of the uh, high success rate of development. So there are lower expectations. Uh, uh, drugs are approved to eat, uh, uh, for drugs with like a smaller uh, clinical uh, benefit. Uh, so the success rate is much higher um, than in non-orphans, but there is also a uh, limitation, uh, which is the end market, the small size of the treatment population. So the, treat the development cost might be cheaper, but then you have a very small market. Uh, it's about 12, 13 uh, patients per 50,000 people for orphan drug, for orphan diseases, but for ultra orphans is even one per 50,000. So it can, for example, stream valleys was used once a year in Europe. Um, so they propose to adapt the current uh, cost effectiveness threshold. So for example, uh, in the US and in the UK, uh, NICE are setting up the uh, cost effectiveness threshold for non orphans at around 20,000 pounds. Uh, they propose it for, and based on calculations of the period at all, they propose it for orphan populations. This threshold would be about two to four times higher. For ultra orphan populations, they propose a uh, cost effectiveness threshold of about 50 times higher, which is approximately 1 million euro per uh, drug. Uh, but they argue that it will still represent the differences and will allow um, some benchmark for uh, insurers. Okay, so uh, I think this is the most interesting part of the uh, paper and probably the most... Uh, we can discuss it quite a lot. Uh, they... Uh, do empirical study on the Austrian uh, insurance market, and they find that uh, from between 2013 and 2021, the medication cost for uh, people uh, with orphan drugs has increased uh, quite far. Um, and so this is what we see on the left side, but on the right side, they produce, uh, they estimate a Gini index for the differences uh, of the spending. So Gini index, they adapt the usual, uh, usual uh, summary measure used to assess income inequality, and they use it in the context of uh, the healthcare spending. Um, and it shows that from between 2013 and 2021, the inequality of spending has increased at least in the Austrian market, but they have evidence from certain other uh, European countries, uh, for example, Italy. Um, so it means that uh, more of, of a larger fraction of the health budget goes to a smaller group of patients. And they uh, consider it uh, inequality of spending. But there are... If I may, yeah. there, there's a problem in that uh, reasoning to me. That was part of the slides that uh, Michelle had sent to me back in December. Here, uh, what you see from the black curve on the left, the black curve, the green curve, is that more people have a zero cost. So basically, you say on spend, and then it's called unequal because so many people can get rid. I mean, don't cost anything. So if an improvement creates an inequality, that's a good inequality in this case. So I, I agree. Um, and so there's a logical mistake in using Gini for this kind of uh, comparison. I agree that Gini is a very problematic measure. It should be first of a stochastic dominance or something, and here it's going in the right direction. 
So this is exactly the problem. They are very well aware that uh, the genie uh, for for standing shouldn't be <clears throat> shouldn't be interpreted as the genie, for example, for uh, income inequality. So in income inequality, we don't want a situation where a small group of people earn uh, the largest fraction of uh, income. We don't want to see uh, one person earning. Uh, billions of euros and majority of society living on minimum wage. But in the healthcare system, we can the majority of society use very low resources being or using uh, very cheap medications to treat the majority of society and using very expensive drugs to treat very small populations. Uh, we don't, it's not necessarily unequal in this sense. Um, and also, uh, this graph, they didn't, uh, Hans Georg Eichler included it, the graph in his presentation, but it's not included in the paper. It shows that when they exclude patients with orphan disease, uh, the effect of, on the, the actual effect on uh, uh, inequality of spending is actually not uh, very large. So if it is uh, 0 0.9 in this graph uh, in 2021, when they exclude uh, orphan drugs, it's only uh, affect 1%, basically it's uh, 0 0.89. Uh, but they say that uh, the impact on the budget is very high and it's also increasing. If in 2013, uh, almost 4% of the budget was designated for 5% uh, of the insured population uh, with orphan disease. By 2021, 8% of the budget is uh, dedicated to treat orphan diseases of only 7% uh, of the insured population. Um, but there are a lot of problems with using G coefficients to represent this inequality. Uh, and uh, there is a very interesting discussion in Atkinson, uh, health inequality, health inequity, and health spending, which tries to, they don't refer to it in the paper, that's also already my uh, perspective, so I will just make it sort of clear. Um, but I think it, it's a very interesting discussion how uh, the use of Gini in, in, in the fish, Gini index to represent the inequality uh, is used when we discuss spending versus when we discuss uh, when we discuss income. Uh, so another very important point in this is that solidarity insurance systems is the regional idea. The, the concept of these systems is to cover for catastrophic health expenditure, not for the cheap drugs. Several things to consider, and uh, almost at the end of the presentation, uh, the last point they make about how to address um, allocative inefficiency is that uh, orphan drugs are used as a laboratory to test uh, very innovative treatments, and we should maximize the way we uh, generate information, the way we make it public, uh, to ensure that we. Uh, can learn, can maximize the learning from these drugs, uh, and they could be used to treat much larger populations eventually. So, for example, CAR T therapies that currently are used only to treat rare diseases could use could be used to treat uh, solid tumors in the general uh, population suffering from cancer, for example. Or we we can learn from uh, new ways of uh, evidence generation. For example, in a lot of uh, clinical trials uh, testing new uh, drugs, we don't have the normal randomized control trial uh, design. We can only use one arm uh, per trial, often with very, very small uh, sample. And uh, recently, there is increased use of uh, using external control to based on real world data uh, when RCTs are not feasible. So this is also useful in general clinical trials, not only in orphan drugs. Um, 
Okay, this is just my perspective already, uh, just to say that the uh, uh, health payer, the cost effectiveness analysis perspective is usually using utilitarian perspective, and uh, but utilitarianism is also a perspective that we can look at. And if we talk about inefficiencies in the resource allocation, uh, there are many ways to interpret the Gini uh, index that they present in their papers. We can say that we are actually addressing uh, uh, horizontal and uh, uh, sorry, horizontal inequity in cluster because we allow people with very high needs uh, uh, to access new treatments. They were not allowed to access in the past. <coughs> So, yeah, this is just a summary of uh, the points they make in the paper. And I think sure. Sure. Maybe more, I, I, in my discussion, maybe uh, you can already uh, ask some questions. Maybe ask some questions online. Yes, we do already have a, a comment. From the uh, Matrons, actually. Mark, are you there? Yes, here I am. Uh, hello, Mark. Mark, your question, please. Well, I think I would like to answer the question of Michelle, Michelle about the four medicinal products. Right, so Sky Sona is for sure one of them because they have an authorization in Europe and because they had too much difficulty with reimbursement, it is not on the market anymore in Europe but still available in the US. Libera must be another example, it's the same, it's not available anymore, authorized in Europe and still available, I think, in Canada and maybe also Chondroselect, but that is not authorized as an orphan drug. So I'm not sure about the other ones, but Michelle is right. Some orphan drugs are authorized in Europe and not available anymore in Europe, but still available in other parts of the world. Um, I just... just uh... I explain why I raised the question because during the COVID-19 pandemic, this has been the case for one very efficient antibody to the virus, which is beptelovimab, which has been extensively used in the US. But the company, by the way, it's LIE, decide not to apply for uh, European approval because they consider that, you know, the way the market is organized in Europe, you know, it's, it's not of interest to them. So, and I'm afraid we will see more and more of those examples. Yeah, that's correct, Michel. I would just like to correct myself. Uh, and say that I jumped to the discussion about the use of uh, Gini index describe uh, uh, inequality in uh, spending, but uh, they stress and they repeat it several times in the papers that it should be used uh, as a tool in negotiation, so with the pharmaceutical companies. So I think this can be a useful uh, tool to demonstrate to pharmaceutical companies the effect on the general uh, so distribution of uh, resources and how it affects the uh, insurance insurers, but maybe it's a bit uh, idealistic. Maybe too stubborn, huh? but I think it's just an improper measure. It's useless in this case. If you if you were doing perfect prevention and you know doubling the number of people who are healthy at very low cost, mm -hmm. your genie would explode, and it's perfect. So it's just not the right measure. Yeah, I think I agree, and the, they discuss it, so I didn't go deep into it, but they discuss it in the, in the paper, and they also say that they can't assess the 
what they want, would like to show is the effect on inequality of uh, benefits, clinical benefits and effect on outcome, health outcome, which would make much more sense. Yes, which but, would be uh, the, the price that you refuse to cover someone yeah. and another one that you agree on someone else and try to objectively do it. The discussion about fairness, of fair, I agree. But if you want one summary indicator, Jimmy is just not the one. Again, I may be stubborn, yeah. but I think it's just not the one. Yes, it's, yeah, it's very interesting discussion. If I may, uh, the, um, I think that, okay, on the one hand, of course, uh, this idea of thinking of equality in terms of uh, who costs what in uh, society in terms of healthcare. Um, it is true that at some level, you know, why are we interested in that from a, as said, from a philosophical point of view? No, because I think this is about insurance. By the way, this is kind of an ex post comparison. But you could also have an example comparison with, you know, behind the middle of ignorance. And there we are all at the risk mm -hmm. of having a rare disease. And so some yeah. people are just. Uh, by the way, uh, even in our system, which is more generous than the US, as uh, Michelle, the question of uh, uh, very expensive drugs being available in the US versus Europe, the question, the next question is for whom? So, of course, uh, for, for very rich people, it may be better in the US. But, but anyway, coming back to, to that, in Belize, I think, I don't think. Um, these numbers uh, say we should spend less on rare diseases because basically there is documentation about the fact that even in countries like ours with more generous healthcare system, it's still costly for you economically to be to be sick because there are the other problems of uh, losing your job or not being able to do some kind of job and all that. So, from that point of view, if we were the Bolsian, then we would. Increase spending, I think, on uh, on uh, people with a disease, whether it's rare or not rare. Uh, on the other hand, one thing which I find interesting in this low X curve uh, thing is that even though rare disease drugs have become much more expensive in the last 10 15 years, the effect on the low X curve is still reasonably low mm -hmm. because there are very few of these people. So let's not exaggerate. Uh, so that's the, of course, this will be music to the ear. I think we said the same thing. Uh, but, uh, but we have to be there, careful. Therefore, that. listening to you, therefore, Gini is not the proper measure for, it's not an indicator of better or worse. Well, as Shiri said, uh, the article suggests that people should be aware of that when thinking of what is their uh, price ceiling. Uh, and you know, it's a way to push people towards these uh, cost efficiency threshold or something like that. But, but I agree with you. I think we all agree that uh, we should take this uh, this Lawrence thing with a grain of salt. Oh, but well, Lawrence may be good. Gini is a summary indicator of something okay. on the Lawrence. Okay, okay. So, and that's not a proper measure. That's what I'm saying. Definitely. But as you know, it's not because it's not perfect that it's uninformative, but I just agree with you. Okay. Are there other questions to uh, Shirley? Or maybe I do my discussion and then we come back. Okay. So, thank you. I guess the slides will be. Yeah. Okay, so we, we agreed uh, uh, with Shiri that I would have a couple of comments after her. So after her very long presentation, so let me <laughs> let me stress that. So I read the paper in detail, and I think. Uh, presentation was excellent. It also went beyond the paper. This uh, mm -hmm. 
this table from uh, Birdu that Al, that's not the paper, but the Birdu that Al paper, all the, some of the uh, comments on uh, welfare and so on are also shared. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, you, uh, it's always, of course, interesting to read the paper, but uh, somehow you're very, very well informed <laughs> already, thanks to the presentation. So what I will, what I will do here is kind of make a couple of comments about uh, what I thought, uh, what I learned, and you know, this may be me, this may be more about me on <laughs> the paper, my own uh, limited uh, knowledge, but uh, so first of all, uh, you hear a lot that, uh, okay, there are so many untreated rare diseases and the like, uh, it's not, you know, this field is not like antibiotics or vaccines or treatment for poor countries. This is already profitable business. That's a, a point uh, which, is, which is relevant. So in that sense, uh, saying uh, it's crazy to look at ways to reduce the cost of these drugs, uh, it's not true. Uh, there are some pretty good profits behind some of them, despite the fact that, of course, uh, the market size is limited. Um, so uh, that's one, uh, one element. Second element, despite the fact that the, paper, the patient population for ECC is very small, costs already add up. So we have a problem. I think it's already six to 8% of the Austrian budget. And Austria is not that different from Belgium. Uh, definitely Austria and Belgium are much closer than either with the US. So uh, I think it's a relevant problem. Uh, of course, uh, one problem which is dealt with, but that's not the first time by Hans-Georg Eichler and uh, his co-author, is the fact that we have a lot of uncertainty and therefore we have to think about uh, what he calls this technical inefficiency. The second point, which I thought uh, was quite well, uh, well made, and I haven't heard before, is the links between these different rare and non-rare diseases. The fact that uh, you have these so-called platform technologies. So uh, gene therapies can work for a lot of things. Uh, ARN messenger was developed for cancer, and boom, it changed the world of COVID. So uh, I think uh, these are things that uh, are relevant. It's one reason behind their idea. Look, uh, maybe it's expensive, but maybe it will be extremely helpful beyond the particular rare disease. Yeah. So I agree with two. I don't know about one. Uh, why is uncertainty higher when it's a rare disease rather than a non rare disease? Because the, right. if anything, the uh, regulatory environment is laxer, so it reduces uncertainty. But it's also it's you know small uh, small sample problem. Yes, but then uh, you the give, you're given a chance. Maybe they, are, uh, maybe they are uh, helpful for your whole life. Your whole life, we don't know this kind of thing. But that's the case for large populations too. Well, population you have large samples, <laughs> so I think that's it's. I think it's basically yes, but it's, so your drug may get killed earlier too. Huh? So anyway, given yes. given the regulation proposed also by Sherry or the article that you're given a chance of uh, you know having partial reimbursement while we're still uncertain that would actually reduce uncertainty massively for the companies well this kind of dynamic uh, pricing is a response to the uncertainty but currently if I, if, if I for what I've read the acceptance rates by uh, the FDA and the EMA is rather higher than lower in comparison with uh, large population medicines. Yeah, the, the problem here, and actually we have to prepare some things for symposium, it's all about the definition of, of rare disease and, uh, and often drugs. The drugs you are referring to are, let's say, classical drugs. Um, and classical drugs basically are drugs which treat the disease, but Usually there are exceptions, actually antibiotics are exceptions. They don't cure the disease. And, uh, and I, that actually that's what many cancer drugs are doing. They, they, 
they transfer cancer into chronic disease. So you may have to take drugs. Uh, okay, so now the uncertainty for very high uh, costly uh, drugs, and we are mainly thinking here about gene therapies. And, and I think that we should do, uh, I said this to Matthias and Hitler, we should have a separate, separate discussion one day on gene therapy, because there the uncertainty is the following. You have a gene, you know that you have to correct the expression of this gene. So you, so you can say, okay, there is not much uncertainty because you know the target and you know how to correct the defect. But the question is, how long will your gene therapy work? So company would say, and this is the case now for you know, Philia, yeah, it's very high. We ask for, I don't know, 1 million euro for a single injection. But look, it will cure you for all the rest of your life. And the, the uncertainty, and that the uncertainty is more on the payer side, is that, you know, are you really sure that the effect of this gene therapy will last for so long? So this is, this is a very important element of uh, uncertainty. Is, yeah, it will work, but for how long? This, this really is a very important parameter to consider. Good. Okay. I think it's a very really big additional dimension of uncertainty, right? um, which adds to the uh, difficulty of having large samples and the like. Yeah, Matthias, just for those interested by point two, it's true that Acker insists on the question of platform, taking the example of, of mRNA. Again, during our symposium, we will have examples of rare disease for which a new treatment has helped to develop the same or similar treatment for much more common disease. And the best example is tocilizumab for rheumatoid arthritis. I don't know if it reached the, the level of a blockbuster, but it starts in a very rare disease. And because it was efficient in this very rare disease, then people say, oh, but perhaps it could also work in this more frequent disease. And we will have other examples so, in your symposium. So it's not only a question of technological platform, it's, there might be also other reasons why, uh, you know, to be, to have success in a rare disease might uh, then have uh, implications for much more frequency. Yeah, yeah, okay. but, but you will hear if you can. Uh, okay, there is a question. Yes, um, I agree with all that, but another important element, in my opinion, is that for several rare diseases, we do not know the natural history of the disease. If you do not know the natural history, it will be very difficult to highlight the clinical effect. Yeah, that's a very important point, uh, wow, which is, that's on the disease side, what I said was on the, <laughs> the duration of therapy, but obviously the natural history is, is also a critical element. You have to be right. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, the micro paper makes a useful distinction between uh, technical efficiency, so trying to optimize the treatment and the cost of the treatment for a given disease, and allocative efficiency, which is, you know, the uh, opportunity cost and uh, which diseases to prioritize. Now, uh, as she said, the main part of the paper is on allocative efficiency, but there are also some comments on technical efficiency. And uh, the uh, some recommendations are not surprising. You need transparency on cost to reduce asymmetry of information. Of course, industry will insist on commercial secrets and the like. So you have a Battle there. 
then you have the performance-based managed entry agreement. Since you have less information for multiple reasons, you want to uh, test waters. You want to be a bit nicer on uh, on authorization, but then have uh, dynamic contracts, uh, which is something that uh, Angeo has been pushing for quite some time. I remember reading seven or five years ago when we discussed that. Um, so I think it's true. My point there, though, that uh, I think um, the public sector is often a bit optimistic in terms of its ability to both obtain information on prices and to renegotiate contracts. I think, and you know, this is not just here, it's with industry in general, they have the best lawyers. And uh, you should start from the position that you will be outsmarted by that. So I think uh, it's true in every regulated sector, but, uh, but I do think it makes sense indeed to try and test waters. Then another comment, which is becoming uh, very general, especially in Europe, you need more collaborations between payers because, of course, uh, the companies will otherwise play one against the other. You want it faster, you need to pay more. So, uh, by now, this was very clearly demonstrated by uh, the COVID vaccines, where in particular, and uh, with uh, Michel and uh, Alain Fischer, we wrote this policy piece. Uh, you know, Israel got it faster, not because they did research on it, not because they produced it, but because they paid more. It's been said, uh, Israel also said to Pfizer, we will uh, give you all the information. So that's exerted some positive externality on the world. But, uh, you know, it's very well documented that this trade off between um, price and availability is there. It's a strategy by uh, by industry, and uh, the only way to limit the impact of this strategy in Europe is to delegate, like for, for COVID vaccine, to delegate the negotiation to the European Commission. Matthias, I can have a comment on this. First, well, I, I don't know exactly which were the difference in terms of prices paid, for example, by, by the US uh, Europe versus Israel, but it's true that but for me, the other important element you allude to this, but I think it was critical, is that because of the organization of the health system in Israel, and it's also a rather small country, Pfizer knew that they would get rapidly key data to demonstrate the efficiency and the impact of the vaccine which they would not get you know, in countries like Europe, just because the system is organized. And just to give one example, which for me is extremely important for also other reasons, you know, one of the complications actually of the Pfizer vaccine, which is the myocarditis in young people, this was uh, identified very early on in Israel. And personally, I'm convinced that if we would not have those data from Israel, we would still be arguing whether the vaccine is really causing this, yes or not. So I think that for Pfizer, the fact that they would have access, the, this privileged access to this important data was certainly an important element uh, of the deal, in addition to what you said about the price. No, and I think in, in all joint uh, what's the uh, Colin, we, we say that, uh, you know, I know. And, uh, <clears throat> and there are there, uh, there are some numbers that exist uh, on prices. But, uh, indeed, it would be good for Europe to, to develop database in the lab. Right? Yeah. yeah, I fully agree. So that, that was my, my question to you. I, I thought the, the key point was that Europe refused to pay as high prices as Asia or the US. The obtaining data in the US, I guess, is pretty messy because you don't yeah. have a centralized authority. So there, I expect the price advantage to consider at a higher price. What about Asia? How, how do we become competitive to attract producers without agreeing to high prices? But that's not the well, precise statement. Mm -hmm. We can play on our market size. You want to be yeah. here? Yes, yes, but I, uh, I just said before, be uh, no, some drugs got uh, the market authorization, 
that is and then they left Europe nonetheless. Yeah. So <coughs> this argument is not enough. They left Europe. No, they left some countries. There is not there's not something <laughs> like leaving yeah. Europe. You leave a country. I, you, I, I heard that from the previous discussion some drugs are not available in Europe, but in Canada or in the US, depending on which. Or, or. Yeah. So they left Europe overall. When they say you don't leave Europe, you leave a country. Um, but indeed, uh, they are not. Uh, so anyway, I think, okay. so I think Canada, they left all countries Canada in is an interesting country because it's a much smaller population. The prices are on average much lower in the US, but they still, uh, I think the US is really, uh, I mean, the US is really bad for, uh, for uh, the, rest of the, the US population. I think they are, government is capturing them. Uh, but anyway, so, but I think the view, the view that, that Europe should get its act together and do better yeah. in terms of coordination, I think by now is uh, well accepted. And uh, I think that uh, an indeed COVID vaccine example, even though they insisted too much on low prices, even the opportunity cost of getting fast is a problem. And I think people have understood that, that uh, we need to do that. I think there is another question by Mark. Yes, um, what Michelle is saying about Israel and the vaccine is correct. And that's why we are trying to set up registers about rare diseases that also will collect all clinical information to approve faster authorization of orphan drugs. Um, that's extremely important. So I hope that we will have an opportunity, but another opportunity to discuss this because I think that you know this is this is really critical. And if we can help in a way or another, we will be happy to, to do it. And um, yeah. I think that this is also something that I don't know if you discussed this directly with the European Commission. Ah, I think there was a question for Michel. You're on mute. Yes, we did that, Michel. So I think that's back to the question of Matthias and, and Michael. What, Okay, what can Europe do? I think first, it's true that you know, many of the uh, innovations come from Europe. So I think that this is, this is an argument that we have. Um, and the second is exactly what uh, Mark is suggesting, is that we try in a way to reproduce what has been shown to be efficient in, in Israel. It's a challenge. But for rare disease, it might be feasible. Yeah, correct. Okay, thank you. So then the next uh, part of the paper is on allocative efficiency. Um, so what uh, the graphs in the paper show is that indeed there is some prioritization of some individuals. It's not just that you pay a lot of money on them, but also there is an explicit policy, the Orphan Drug Act in the US, and the EU orphan drug policy, which says, look, uh, we will make your life easier for uh, orphan disease in terms of length of patent, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, hurdles to get approval and all these kind of things. So at some level, uh, some people are saying, look, you cannot complain about high prices to some extent, uh, it is the design of policies. Of course, if you give a patent, which is a monopoly, a legal monopoly to some companies, you should expect prices to be high. On the other hand, uh, the, uh, today, probably, uh, we've gone too far. But the, uh, uh, and indeed, the, the other thing is that uh, don't keep in mind the uh, platform technologies on the line, the fact that uh, indeed, for even possibly for non orphan diseases, you have benefits and so on. So, which suggests that, in a sense, part of these high prices should maybe be part of the research budgets rather than the uh, social security budget. Exactly. 
So, uh, but anyway, they, they don't go that far, but I think it's an actual thing here. Now, uh, they say, look, since we have probably gone too far, uh, insist on transparency on cost once again, develop maximum price threshold, uh, and share information across trade is easy to help this platform. Because indeed, if these things are supposed to be helpful for other diseases, the information should be there. To be collected, so industry should limit its uh, shouting for commercial secrecy, and patients, hospitals, and the like should do a better job at collecting the data. Uh, so all the stakeholders should uh, should have. Can we have data about the distribution of these costs? Because I, I, I'm always afraid I'm drawing myself conclusions based on the top. Five or ten percent of the drugs, the most expensive ones. Well, the when there is a mass of cheap drugs as well. Well, I think the uh, there the information in the first graph, not the Logan curve graph, of the uh, uh, the Eichler paper gives you the data person for person. Uh, yeah, but not uh, drug per drug. I don't know if it's a handful of drugs that create this peak, and you have ninety-five drugs that uh, that are decent. Well, typically, people don't have two or three rare diseases at the same time. So, but, but I, I agree with you that I guess it's a great they need it. They need it to have that information to compute the cost. Um, yeah, they don't separate. So, it's a drug cost per patient. So, if you're treated with an orphan drug and other drugs, it's all calculated together. It's not separate. That's a very good point. But uh, the problem is they, they have. Created this database, which is quite helpful, and which they should share since we have the platform on research. <laughs> so, the, the, the database is uh, widely available, or we need I don't to know, pay for that. We can, you know, have Georg teach it in, uh, in, uh, in this program. I'm sure discussion can be had. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so I was also asked to. Uh, to read uh, a shorter paper in the New England Journal of Medicine entitled Sources of Innovation in Gene Therapies Approaches to Achieve Affordable Prices. Uh, this is a paper that starts saying, look, these rare diseases, uh, treatment are really expensive and all that. It's uh, one of the authors, Jerry Avon from the Harvard Medical School, who has been an advocate. Uh, uh, these kind of things. Um, they recommend, like uh, many people, uh, reasonable price clauses, reference pricing. That's especially helpful for the US because indeed they are the top. So if they start saying, you know, we shouldn't pay more than Canada, uh, well, if Canada is worried that all of a sudden they will, uh, they will see. So there are, there are issues, uh, but it's a US paper. But two points that they make. Uh, one is uh, uh, that uh, maybe the funders, they have in mind the NIH and all that, they should insist on non exclusive licenses uh, so that uh, if uh, a drug has been uh, subsidized a lot along the way by the public sector, uh, we should limit monopolization. So we shouldn't go, you know, okay, every company should uh, deserve. A reward of what they have done, but not what they have not done. <laughs> That's the point. Huh? So, um, so in French, you could say, Tout travail mérite salaire, mais tout salaire mérite travail. So, if the work has been done by, uh, by the university, they can think, by the way, there has always been this idea of the Bible Act being so wonderful that it has accelerated the, pro the process of uh, innovation because universities can now patent this stuff. True, but uh, I think down the line, some companies have benefited a lot. And so the question is, indeed some people are saying high price in the US are good because they push for innovation. The question is, can you push for innovation with uh, a lower price tag? So this is really the, the problem. Uh, how far is too far? Uh, the other thing that they say, which I think is interesting, um, they suggest that academia could stop less early in the process. Uh, because right now, 
what you have is uh, academia being funded really a lot by uh, the sector. And then at some point, they sell to let's say, a biotech company that then sells to uh, a big pharma company. And uh, maybe, maybe uh, academia could do a bit more uh, and have a uh, reasonable reward for it, but not necessarily uh, monopoly reward. So uh, maybe they could go later in the clinical trials. Uh, they uh, could prepare, I'm, I'm talking about here examples that they get in the paper, uh, they could prepare FDA submissions. They could even do some manufacturing. And they say that the Swiss hospitals, they do that for some kind of uh, treatment. So uh, the point being, if the private sector is too expensive, maybe you should develop alternatives. And if anything, competition will help because they may decide that if they want to keep doing it, they may decide to do it at a lower price tag. So I think that's... Um, an interesting uh, question, how widely applicable it is, I don't know, but uh, I do think that uh, <clears throat> there are in fact some things that uh, connect with uh, what we've done with the Alain Michel about benefit corporations, which is also a limitation of the uh, private uh, profit uh, motive. Can I can I comment a little yeah. bit on that? Because we discussed this Friday on Friday with Hans Georg Teiker, and he actually gave the example that the idea that including the nonprofit sector or at least further in the development chain, that it would lower prices is not really the case. For example, he gave uh, the idea, well, I think we discussed the idea of the University of Pennsylvania with the part T self and the fact that they had monopoly on the uh, patents. But he gave the example, very interesting, uh, Lee, that for cystic fibrosis, the patient uh, advocacy group were involved uh, together with the company to bring the drugs on the market. And that everybody expected since the patient um, uh, patient uh, organization was involved that the prices would be low, but actually the prices were just as high because they then argued that they could use the profits to again reinvest in cystic fibrosis research, but that actually this non profit uh, stakeholder should try to weigh on this high price. So I'm not sure whether it would help. And that's well, it was said that when. For example, academia, who are, well, somewhat rewarded as well on the patent applications that they file and the patents that they can license out, that when they smell the money, that it's difficult to resist to the, yeah, to this smell and to this idea of, of earning as well as, an, uh, as a business model. So maybe you can as well comment on that. No, no, I think it's a, it's a good point. First of all, uh, what I was just saying that uh, the Bayer Act, uh, maybe uh, indeed some researchers uh, were lured by the money, like, you know, we are all humans after all, and then they could be uh, make an alliance with the, the industry in order to jointly benefit. Uh, and then I do think that we have to identify who has what kind of interest. So I think patient organizations are quite helpful in terms of, uh, you know, uh, telling people about the, the fact that the disease is, uh, is really bad, uh, raising awareness and all these kind of things. It is true that naturally they want the drug available you know, they just want it. And if the price is high and the taxpayer pays, that's fine for them. So they are not going to be necessarily the, uh, the cost minimization advocates. I would, more, I would trust more the Minister of Health who would be in trouble with the Minister of Finance <laughs> if uh, the budget goes too, too high. But uh, somehow what we need, and uh, this we said that a couple of times, how do we align the interests of the various stakeholders? Mm -hmm. and, and I do agree that this is not a magical solution. Um, but, uh, but I think 
uh, it is, uh, you know, the fact is that right now, because people say industry, big pharma and the like, I think it's, uh, it's not a good, a good denomination, big pharma. I don't think, I don't think small is beautiful in this world. It was great that Pfizer could deploy mRNA vaccine. So size is not bad. What is problematic is the fact that these companies are run by shareholders who only care about money. And the question is, how do you involve the stakeholders? Mm -hmm. uh, because you know, a lot of these people who work there are scientists. They are not obsessed with money. I'm afraid some shareholders are obsessed with money mm -hmm. and they have gotten mm -hmm. too much power. And I think that's the, uh, how do we balance these tensions? Um, there is a comment by Mark. Um, yes, I think non-exclusive licenses is very important for repurposed orphan drugs. So another company already brought it on the market. They did all the toxicity studies, everything. The clinicians did off-label use and by off-label use, they had some kind of clinical evidence. And then it is brought on the market by another company. They had nothing to do with the first and nothing to do with the clinical effectiveness neither. So I think that's a very important point for repurposed orphan drugs. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. About uh, equilibrium between stakeholders, this is a very important question. But I would like to raise that the patient association are very powerful and should be taken more in consideration. I will give you one example, which is the teletone in France. Teletone is run by patient association. They created the teletone. And the teletone in France is bringing dozens of millions for research. So it is uh, important to consider this part of the stakeholders as uh, important for the community. No, I, I agree with that. And by the way, currently in Belgium, TV for cancer is not necessarily a it's patient association or is it is uh, uh, FTL or whatever. Oh, yeah. Michel, uh, no, okay, those are different things. You know, TV is only supporting actually PhD students and some research projects. They would never invest in uh, even in early drug development. Teleton is an interesting example. It happens that I know their director general quite well. I can tell you that they had to fight with Big Pharma because actually they own a patent that, that Big Pharma needed, I think it was for, I'm not sure, but for an mRNA vaccine or something. It, it was a terrible fight. The point is that Teleton is an exception because as, as you know now, but they are funded through, you know, these uh, TV shows and, and all these things. Unfortunately, most of the other patient organizations, I don't know if Mark is still online, but he, he might confirm or disagree with me. But in my perspective, most patient organizations receive funding and are still alive because they receive funding from the pharma companies. That's, That's very correct. And it's not true for Teleton. So it's an interesting remark. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just want to be sure that's what you have in mind. Uh, are you specifically arguing for this kind of models in the case of orphan diseases or in general? Um, so, because if you start being stricter on rare diseases than on the rest, you go back to square one of desensitizing uh, research on rare diseases. Well, I think, first of all, this is uh, what the paper is uh, suggesting, it's not me. Uh, the, uh, and they are talking about gene therapies. Um, now, uh, my feeling is that in the end, uh, the, uh, it's all about costs and benefits. Uh, I would argue that uh, for any disease where it's difficult, uh, when people say, oops, 
complicated to have clinical trials and the like. So we'll do it. We we will pay quite some amount for this. I think it's maybe there is a comparable advantage for universities to do it, and then if it can be used a price tag overall, that's a good idea. But uh, but you know what? There are only ten minutes left, uh, so let me maybe uh, try and wrap up. Um, so first of all, this is what uh, the European Commission improved affordability strategies uh, said in 2021. First, enhanced competition. Second, exchange information on, uh, on pricing, cost effectiveness, payment for human policy and affordability, and enhanced transparency. Now, uh, exchange information, enhancing transparency, everybody agrees. Uh, enhancing competition, I will argue that it is indeed a good idea to, uh, on, of course, on the other hand, you want to give funds where which are created monopolies. Uh, I would say that you want indeed possibly more competition among the suppliers of drugs, and you want less competition between member states. Uh, you want to create some buyer power because right now, you have 27 member states facing a couple of, uh, of global companies, and that's not uh, balanced. So uh, I think there. I think that one thing we added to this debate is this idea of setting up benefit corporations. Uh, we also suggest reasonable prices. Everybody agrees on that. We uh, suggested centralizing uh, the purchases, which more and more people agree with. Uh, let me just focus on uh, the idea of benefit cooperation. Uh, I would I would summarize it by saying, what about softening the exhausting contest between, on the one hand, regulators and payers, and on the other hand, shareholders of these global companies, which are doing too well in this context. Uh, contest, and uh, the point is not. Let us forget about you know big pharma versus uh, let this is talking about the primacy of shareholders in this industry and the fact that the returns they require are really high. Uh, already economists talk about the the uh, equity premium puzzle. Why is it that equity is so much more profitable than, uh, than other assets? And on top of that, uh, big pharma beats the market. People, some people like Andrew Lowe, who's a, an expert in both health economics and finance, the, he says three percent a year. So that's not reasonable. We cannot afford that kind of uh, number. And so, of course, the key is to make the benefit corporation corporation objective concrete. Uh, you could, uh, the, right now, uh, you could tell them, look, you know. Uh, Companies, because we are in a market where the public sector has bargaining power, they end up paying. So, you know, they should get value for money. Uh, so, we could say, look, you know, uh, do create benefit corporation division with admission to pursuit of reasonable prices. So, don't make losses, but don't generate excess risk adjusted rates of return. Today, if management were to do that, they will be sued by shareholders because shareholders are legally mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. owners of the company mm -hmm. and the top management mm -hmm. is their employee. So already by saying that, uh, they won't be facing uh, these uh, legal challenges. Um, so then indeed COVID-19, we talked about that, but, but indeed it's a good example because it has been documented by Margaret Guy, who was in an earlier uh, conference of I3H, how indeed uh, companies uh, play countries against one another with this trade off. You want it faster, you want it at all, you need to pay. So, uh, as I say, this is something we can do just at the EU level. Um, and uh, you, we should, I think there are particular reasons for rare diseases for which coordination would be relevant because, uh, you know, okay, COVID vaccines, maybe we got too low prices uh, at the, because the, the cost of emergency was so high, but 
the point of rare diseases is trying to reduce excessive prices. That's the uh, and uh, so uh, and on top of that, we are already trying to do that. Uh, Benelux A is uh, an association between Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Austria, and the Ireland. Uh, there are others that are trying to do it. Ballet group for Southern Europe, Visegrad group for the Visegrad country, the Nordic Pharmaceutical Forum. It's all documented, so let's uh, do it all together. Um, also, given the limited market size, I think the value of going broader is important. We could offer the prospect of higher sales. Uh, if all of a sudden it's uh, available in the 27 countries, so uh, it could be win-win also for industry. Uh, we could even have uh, advanced market commitments like with vaccines. Uh, the uh, ideally coupled with a percentage of profits to be refunded by the company in case these turn out to be higher than expected. So this is back to the, uh, the advance of the uh, managed entry agreements, uh, which uh, I think uh, could be developed. And uh, also organization of clinical trials. Uh, we could put together, you know, in the US they have the NIH. The NIH is five times the budget of the National Science Foundation, which is already <laughs> a quite uh, a big thing. So uh, why don't we put together uh, a number of our research budget in life sciences among new member states? At the level, I think uh, for uh, for rare diseases, I think uh, to make a lot of sense. It would be interesting to compute a bit uh, what uh, what it would cost uh, looking at. Uh, what the US does because definitely the US, even though it's such a, a high spending uh, country, this would give you a, a maximum budget order uh, which, for what would be needed in, in Europe. So, um, conclusion of all this um, some recommendations are very natural more transparency on cost and on value, better coordination between payers. Um, Defining a methodology to improve technical efficiency for rare diseases would be a good idea. That their lawyers will outsmart you. And this should be the starting point. Let's not be naive politicians here. Um, and uh, I think I like this idea of positive externality of rare diseases, of other types of diseases. Uh, but that will only work if you make the information available uh, at a low price. So it reinforces the idea of non exclusive licenses, huh? I think, uh, because otherwise you will not benefit from the positive externality. Um, and finally, uh, I think uh, limiting excessive shareholder power, uh, there are different ways to go. One is to say, okay, the public sector should take over. That's a bit of a communist idea. The other idea is benefit cooperation, which is more middle of the road. non exclusive licenses is the third one. Maybe, I think it's definitely a good research topic to, uh, to see uh, what is one of the pluses and minuses of the various works. So anyway, thank you. Any last comments? From both presentations were great. We hope to have the slides. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <indeed. Available. laughs> the recordings and the slides will be made available uh, at Omar's site. As I see that we have only one minute left, I would like to thank both speakers. Uh, she, thank you for a very clear uh, presentation of uh, Eichel's paper, but also giving, giving your own comments on it. Thank you so much, Matthias, for all your conclusions and some recommendations. Indeed, I think there's definitely much more research questions come up that come up now and uh, that we can work on. Thank you so much for uh, being online with us, uh, notably Mark, uh, for your uh, useful and interesting comments and all the others. Too. Thank you for uh, being with us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for the research. Thank you, everybody. Bye.